chapter 4, Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse 6. Did a sweet little wedding yesterday, met some neighbors of mine, so that was good. Always like meeting new people and connecting with new folk. And people have lived, I mean, one street over from Baptist, on Baptist Encampment, where our, our second church is, and uh, been there 20 years and never been on our property. And uh, I thought everybody had been on that property that lived down that road, so I invited them over, and we'll see what happens. They will go along, but always wanting to connect and, and meet with people. Amen. This is, a, again, uh, it's not a biblical holiday. Everybody understand that? Thanksgiving is not biblical. It's American. And uh, there's a difference there. The biblical holiday is every day. Every day for us to be thankful. Amen. But my thought here today, it's where I've been that makes me thankful for where I'm going. If you don't remember where you've been, you're not going to be thankful for where you're at right now. If you can't remember the, the, you know, where he pulled you out from, how life was before you met Christ. Uh, and let me just, my pastor mentioned a word to me this morning, a phrase, and it resonated inside my spirit when he said the gift of repentance. He said our nation today doesn't understand the gift of repentance. And when he said gift of repentance, a gift is something that's giving without any strings attached. A gift is a blessing. A gift is something you can't wait to unwrap. And when, I, when he said those words, a gift of repentance, it hit me, what a joy we've got to be able to repent, amen, of missteps, uh, uh, trespasses, things of that nature, not to give you an escape or anything, but to remind you what a gift it is that it wasn't just a one-time thing. Amen. That you can say, God, forgive me, and he washes and cleanses you from the things that have happened in your life. It's a gift. Everybody say a gift. Yeah. Man, sometimes you've got to open that gift and quit living in, in uh, 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 self-righteousness and doing your own thing. Say, God, I just want to thank you for the gift. Amen. So there's so many gifts that God gives us and looks after us. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Are you comfortable? Give me just a moment here, and I'll get to you. You know, there is no question in our minds that God's good, and we praise Him in all things. But it's our Thanksgiving season, we call it. We'll have a Christmas season right after this, and then we'll have a fasting season. Everybody prepare yourself. We fasted in January, and I'm excited about it now. Only now. But many of us, you already know, whether you like it or not, you're going to be storing up to prepare for fasting. Amen. You can't help yourself when you get that cranberry sauce and dressing and gravy, and giblet gravy without liver, glory to God. Amen. And, and all that uh, turkey and down here in the South Texas, that fried turkey y'all be having and, and tur du turkey, dunk tur turkey duckings, duck and turkings or whatever y'all do. Yeah, some of y'all down here sh shove a, tur a duck in a turkey and a chicken in a duck. Amen. And try to eat all that. Bless your heart. You need to fast. It's crazy. But being this season, it's across the country. Millions of people are getting ready for a week of great celebration. Some of you, like me, are planning to do a little traveling, amen, to get to where you're going. You're looking forward to that Thanksgiving week. And my memories are always around those two big holidays because I, Easter was not a thing for us being raised up, not in church. But uh, it's amazing how much I learned after I got in the house of God. I didn't even know about Thanksgiving and what it really meant. I didn't even not understand how it started and things of that nature. I just had a little schooling, but we didn't get taught all that. Same thing with Christmas, the birth of Christ, and the coming of Jesus, and all the different things that, that lie inside there, Joseph and Mary, the virgin, the Bethlehem, the star, the, the three wise men that showed up after Jesus was about three years old. Amen. Uh, all these things. I didn't know them until I got in the house of God. This is a learning place for you. Can I get an amen? You learn stuff while you're here. You pick up on things here. You go, why? I didn't understand that. I didn't, I didn't know that. Amen. That's good things for you to know, good things for me to know. So I'm always learning. I'm always trying to pick up. But millions of people will stop to give thanks. My prayer is believers and unbelievers for one day the nation will stop and give thanks and we'll call it Thanksgiving. And it'll be on that Thursday. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 says rejoice in the Lord always. Hmm. Everybody say always. always. Boy, that's a hard one, isn't it? I will say it again. Rejoice. The word rejoice actually means to spin around it, with excitement. It, it carries with it the, the connotation of a dog chasing its tail. So he says rejoice and rejoice again. 
Amen. Remind yourself to stay into this, uh, what's the word I'm looking for there? Uh, uh, reciprocating circle of joy. Amen. To keep it going inside of your life. Amen. So when you do that, uh, it, and then it says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. The word anxious is worry. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, every situation, by prayer, and don't forget to write it down if you need to, petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Amen. So that's such a powerful verse for us just to walk through right now. So whenever I have a Thanksgiving, whenever I'm praying, I make my request to God. Amen. And answer my request, Father, I'll thank you for your word. Anoint my lips to share it. Let our ears be open today to pick up on something maybe we've never thought of. In Jesus' name, everyone sit. Amen. God bless you. It was 1620. Many of you were not born then. The pilgrims had just landed. Amen. We understand they came to America first, actually, because they loved God. They believed that God was leading them. And this is important. They were walking in the light they knew. You can't look back at the pilgrims and call them perfectionists or people that, that knew everything about God. They just wanted to leave the tyranny of England. In leaving that king and all the, the tyranny there, they came to America. They began to sell over, and the pilgrims began to settle. Amen. And, of course, we know of the churches that are all up along the eastern seaboard, uh, all the colleges, the Harvards, the Yales, amen, all of those schools were first started as Christian communities, uh, Cambridge, things of like that. It all came out of England, amen, over here, and then they started settling and preaching and talking about God. Amen. It was important to do that because ingratitude affects God. When you're not thankful, God notices. When you're thankful, of course, he notices. But when you're not thankful, God notices. Amen. The book of Psalm, chapter 106, verses 12 through 15 says, Then they believed his promises and sang his praise. Well, when things are good, you can sing, can't you? Amen. We can sing. This is talking about the children of Israel yeah, after they came out of uh, Egypt. Amen. After they came out of slavery. But, man, watch that word. Verse 13. But they soon forgot what he had done and did not wait for his counsel. In the desert, they gave in their cravings. In the wasteland, they put God to the test. So he gave them what they asked for, and he sent a wasting disease upon them. But they soon forgot what he had done. So what, what are we talking about here, Pastor? We're talking about that every day the manna was there in the morning for them to pick up and eat. So he fed them. Every day that they traveled, the sun beaten down, he put a cloud over them. He umbrellaed them, amen, and looked after them. This took place for 40 years. Amen. He looked after them. At night when they were cold and they didn't have enough cover, amen, he put fire over them and he kept them warm. It was an amazing thing that God did. But here's the thing. After you get this for so long, you forget what you already had. And, you, and because you forgot how good it is, you start thinking. And so you get the next generation come along, well, your kids come along, and all the kids know are manna in the morning, Amen. Cloud over, the, over me during the day, fire over me at night. It's like this is natural. So what happens is they begin to forget. And when they forgot, they started crying out for something. You know what they wanted? Quail. They wanted meat. I'm, I would too. If you're forced into veganness, and you have to be a vegan, I'm sure manna had something to do with it. I'm, I, I'm almost positive that was vegan food. Amen. There's no meat in it. So they began to cry out for meat and meat and meat. And they yelled and they got mad. But the thing was, they became ungrateful. And being ungrateful began to affect God. So God sent them what they wanted. He sent them quail. Do you know that it rained snow, literally, 24 hours in the Buffalo, New York area, five foot of snow, five foot of snow. Well, when the quail came, the quail came up to their nostrils. Amen. It literally four, five, six feet of quail. You couldn't, you couldn't kill enough quail. You couldn't eat enough quail. The birds came in. The problem was because he couldn't eat it all, then, the, then it started to rot. When it started to rot, it began to give disease among the people. In other words, beware and be careful of what you get, are ungrateful for. If God starts sending you what you ask for, it can kill you. Amen. So here's what happened here. So there are several signs of an ungrateful heart. Romans chapter 1 verse 21 tells us, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up 
foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. If you look through the history of humanity, you will see certain um, idols and people think of what God is like, whether it's a, a short, a, a chubby, uh, a man, bald-headed, sitting, uh, could be a cow, amen, it could be a, a, a symbol of something uh, sexual, amen, but they, this is what they think God is like, like a woman, they get foolish in their mind. The Scripture tells us he's a he. The Scripture tells us he's a father. The Scripture tells us he's a good God. Amen. And when you start letting your mind wander, that's what he's saying there. These people got, became ungrateful. And if you read the rest of Romans chapter 1, it may shock you of where we're at in this generation today to what God was saying because they, they gave up on who God was. Amen. God never changes. He ain't going to change. He ain't going to change because you don't like the way God is. Amen. He's just who he is. And he's not going to change because you don't like the way you are. Amen. You're born a boy. You're born a girl. Accept it. Learn to enjoy it. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. I thank God that uh, I is who I is. Amen. In another message, uh, Charles Spurgeon, one of the great preachers of yesterday, said, I fear there are thousands who will call themselves Christians who are not thankful, and yet they never thought themselves very guilty on the account. I'll say it again. I fear there are thousands who call themselves Christians who are not thankful, and yet they never thought themselves very guilty on that account. He says, first, we receive from God's hand daily blessings without ever giving thought as to where they came from. God has blessed us over and over again and given us blessings. We don't even realize where they came from. Amen. We look at other people and think it came from other people or, 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 or from the earth or something, but God blessed us with that. And, and I'll say this, too. Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, I believe you need to recognize where the good things came from. Amen. That God was good to you. Uh, God's mercy the Bible says in you every morning. Every morning I get up, I get a new set of mercies over me. Hallelujah. Life, breath, health, friends, food, clothing, his kindness of others, a good job. You go, you, you get, uh, you got finances enough to meet your needs. All of it comes every day, and it is if we run back to a back door and let, uh, let in those blessings because we're afraid to let them in through the front door. In other words, we're afraid to acknowledge that it was God that gave us the job, gave us the air, gave us the food, gave us the friends. I want to tell God, thank you. When I pray over my food, I'm not just praying over my food. I'm telling God, thank you. If, I, if it's a fried bologna sandwich, thank you. Amen. Whatever it is that I'm getting to, to enjoy today, thank you. For the vehicles I get to drive, thank you. Amen. You've got to learn to appreciate. Second, we grumble about what we don't have. And the reason we grumble about what we don't have, we begin to compare ourselves with others around us. And when you compare yourself, you demoralize yourself. Amen. You were born a certain way. You've got a certain physique. I told my pastor today, I said, Pastor Mike, I'm going to tell you something. I worked out yesterday. He just asked me how my move. I said, well, I worked out again. I got in couple times this week, and I said, I, I can get up easier than I used to. I can move a little better because I know I'm, 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 I'm working most of my, but working out has not helped me lose weight at all. I ain't lost one pound starting to work out. I have found out that muscle that just keeps on putting weight on me. Amen. <laughs> It's, it's just tearing me up, but I, but I got to keep doing it. So we, we look and we begin to compare ourselves. One of the first things I did when I started going to the gym is remind myself, don't compare yourself to her. Because that girl right there can lift more weight than you. She can run further than you. She's faster than you. She's 30 years younger. Amen. Don't compare yourself to those in the gym. Where you do your thing. Can I get an amen? amen? Amen. Find somewhere where you can just do your thing. So second, we grumble about what we don't have. Again, I go back to the children of Israel. If it was manna, we wish we had quail. If it's cereal, we complain because we wanted eggs. If it's, uh, if it's sweatpants, we wish we had jeans. Amen. We begin to complain. We have 500. We wish we had 1,000. 1,000. We wish we had 5,000. If we do not have cancer, we complain about our arthritis until we get cancer. Amen. Stop complaining about what you don't have. It's, it's, it's all right to be that way. So what's the secret, Pastor, of having a good Thanksgiving or living a life of Thanksgiving? Well, it's, it's some people approach this holiday, they, they, they rejoice, and others it's in trepidation. I mean, it's like uh, I, I'm nervous about this holiday because I'm going to go be with family that I've not been with in a year, and there's going to be issues that are unresolved, and uh, they lie right below the surface, and 
Well, I got to deal with that. And you, you got to get into a place in your life where you say, you know what? I don't care about what's going to go on here. I'm going to give that God thanks over this Thanksgiving. Amen. If you add up the pluses and the minuses of the past year, you have to start looking for what's plus. I'm, I'm going to give you the secret. It's one word. It's just simply contentment. It's just being content. The problem with many of us is we approach, amen, we're focused on the circumstances of life. Far too many of us take our happiness and our joy and our contentment by how things are going on the outside. Contentment is not a matter of outward circumstances. Contentment is a matter of understanding how much you already have and how much God has already blessed you with. That's what contentment's about. Man, if I can just be content with what I have. Now, listen, it don't mean that something's not going to get added to it. Often in life, we add, we subtract, but I'm going to tell you this. As much as God adds to you, learn how to allow things to be subtracted from you. Amen. If he blesses you with one thing, learn how to let go of something else. Amen. Don't hoard it all up. Amen. Learn how to release it and let some things go. That's the blessing of being content. Amen. I'm blessed with what I got, but I don't have to keep everything I got. Amen. I don't have to, by the way. Just saying in love, I have two dogs. If you need one, let me know. Uh, but you're only going to get one of them. That's not true. I have fallen in love with that little stray dog that showed up. She, oh, she owns us now. Amen. It's amazing what a dog like that can do. And, it, and, and the big dog, he don't care. He don't, he, don't even like, he don't even pay no attention to her. So it's all good. Philippians 4.11. Again, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed, hungry, whether living in plenty, or in want. Paul said that. When I read that, he said the secret. Everybody say the secret. I often use phrases like the secret sauce. You ever seen anybody? Mr. Gant taught our guys how to barbecue, but he had that rub he put on. The meat. It was the secret sauce. Amen. People got the secret sauce. They'll, they'll hide it. You know, they, they, they don't want to put a label on it because they don't want you to steal their secret sauce. Every good marriage has a secret sauce. Every good parent understands the secret sauce. To take. They know which, which child needs a certain thing. Amen. He reacts to a certain thing. Which grandchild will be blessed by others? A phone call to my grandson will light his world. A phone call to my granddaughter will frustrate her. She ain't got time to talk to Paul Paul right now. Amen. She got to go do her thing. Just learning the secret sauce. So Paul said, let me tell you the secret sauce is being content. It's just learning to be content. Amen. Being thankful. Contentment, again, is realizing how much you already have, how much God has already given you, how rich you already are. It brings me back to the book of Proverbs. I love the book of Proverbs. If you read any book this year between now and December 34th, read the book of Proverbs. Amen. 31 chapters in it, 31 days in a year, I mean in a month. Amen. Take a chapter a day and watch what happens. But one word keeps popping up over and over in the book of Proverbs, and I'd love to share it with you. It is the word better. Amen. It, it deals with this comparison, how you compare. You've heard me say for years, good, better, best, never let it rest. Your good is better and your better is best. Well, sometimes you very seldom hit best. Amen. Best is what you're after, but you may not always get best. So, yeah, but if you can get better, better is better than good. Amen. Good's better than worse. So go for the better. So he says here, it, it better, better a nobody. Oh, everybody wants to be somebody, don't we? Amen. We, we, social media is promoting that. It's causing all of us to want to be influencers. Amen. And uh, so we, we're after that. But the scripture tells us this, better to be a nobody and then have a servant than pretend to be somebody and have no food. Do you know how many people that are pretending to be somebody on social media that are really ain't got nothing going for them? They ain't got no money. They ain't got no house. They ain't got, they're depending on you to take care of them all the time. Amen. That's what he's saying here. That verse cheers me up when I read it. Better to have no reputation and be thought of as a nothing and have your needs met than to be some hot air big shot and yet starve to death in your own home. Yeah. I was in a, I just to say this to y'all, I, I picked up a new truck. The Lord blessed me with it, and I got a nice truck. I was telling my pastor about that. I said, it's a, it's a nice truck. I mean, I've, I've had nice trucks. It's a nice truck. I said, but I've never had a truck with political seats. He said, hey, what would you say? I said, my truck got political seats. 
He said, what do you mean? I said, I hit a button over there and it starts blowing cold air up my back. <laughs> Is that good? Yeah, he laughed too. I thought it was funny. Better a little with fear. Better. Everybody say better. Come on, say better. Better a little with fear. In other words, Proverbs 15 says, better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Fear of the Lord just simply means what I, I have an, a, a, a reverence for him, knowing he could suck the air right out of my lungs just like that. He could change my life within a moment. He could, he could shift my, the whole, the whole uh, uh, career of my life. He meant he could do it. So it's better to have a little fear of the Lord, amen, than great wealth with turmoil. Too many of us have bought into the notion that money brings happiness. Every time I hear about the lottery and people wanting to win the lottery, the more I think about how it will destroy your life. Amen. Too much money, too quick. Talk to the 18, 19, 20-year-old athletes who get all this money and watch how their lives are destroyed. You, if you haven't learned how to handle a, a dollar, amen, learn to give 10 cents on the dollar in your tithing. If you've not learned how to invest uh, another 10, 15% of that into somewhere else, then you're not going to be able to handle a million dollars when you get it, or, or two million, or a billion. You can't do it. Amen. Learning how to handle finance is a powerful thing. So he said, it's better to fear the Lord than to have great wealth where there's turmoil. And believe me, when you get great wealth, there'll be turmoil. There'll be people that you forgot you were kin to. People will start showing up. The Scripture is not against wealth. It's not against prosperity, but it is very honest about it. God gives prosperity to give a believer influence. God gives you finances. He gives you things. He blessed you with stuff so that you can have influence, not over people, but with people, to be able to help somebody out. How can you help the poor if you ain't got nothing to help them with? How can you be a blessing to your family if you ain't blessed? So it's better to have the fear of the Lord than wealth, amen, where there is turmoil with that. Better. Everybody say better. Come on, say it again. Better to be right. Proverbs 16, 8. Better a little with righteousness than much gain within, with injustice. That's simply to say it's better to do right with struggle, amen, to go line upon line, precept upon pre precept, to keep growing in life than to do wrong and be rich. Better to follow the rules and go broke than to cheat and climb your way to the top. Amen. That's not what the Lord wants. It's better to struggle to make ends meet, but know that you are righteous in the eyes of God than to cheat other people to have it all your way. Everybody say better. Better to have love. Proverbs 15, 17. Better a Thanksgiving meal. I just added that word. Of vegetables. Where there is love than a fatted calf with hatred. It means it's better to eat cold pinto beans where people love you than to have a T-bone where they can't stand to look at your face. There's a reason why people get depressed at Thanksgiving. Amen. Why they hate to go back home. It's because you know that when you go back home, you're going to see all those relatives you ain't seen in a while, and especially when some of them uh, get a little tanked up with that holiday spirit. And all those old hurts and old things start coming out. And what ought to be joyful, ought to be a happy time, becomes an unbearable struggle. You just got to pray to God to survive until the time you get to go back home. I'd rather eat vegetables at the house, amen, than have a banquet with somebody where there's turmoil. Everybody say better. Better to be humble. Woo, better to be humble. Proverbs 16, 19, better to be lowly in spirit and among the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. The Message Bible says it a little better. It says it's better to live humbly among the poor than to live it up among the rich and famous. You know, the rich and famous don't stay rich and famous. Amen. They don't stay that way. But to learn how to live humbly. Many years ago, I'm going to tell you, 30 years ago, a pastor friend of mine looked at me. He told me that humility was the position of strength. There were times that I forgot that principle, and it always cost me. Amen. If I could live humbly. If I can humble myself, amen, when the crowds are large and stay humble. If I can stay humble when they're small. If I can just say, God, whatever you're doing in the lives of people, and you do it through the ministry of the Little Country Church and all of our ministries here, help us stay humble. Amen. Help us remind ourselves that we too, amen, were there at one time. We're not above anybody. Amen. We're not better than anybody. Can I get an amen? Amen. The Bible says better to eat bread in peace. Proverbs 17, 1. Sounds a lot like the other verse there. Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. Don't want that. Amen. And again, the message, a meal of bread and water in contented peace is better than a banquet spiced with quarrels. I don't want no quarrels over the holidays. 
Amen. I want blessings. Last point here, better to be blameless. Better to be a poor man whose walk is blameless than a rich man whose ways are perverse. Amen. The message says it's better to be poor and direct than rich and crooked. Amen. Learn how. So, you know, and again, Pastor Joseph, you come. The, the, the blessing here when I'm reading this book is this. This is spoken by one of the wealthiest men in the world. His name was Solomon. And with all the wealth that he had, he said, you know what? It's better to have a little where there's peace than a whole lot where there's turmoil. He said, I've learned something here. Amen. He, you can learn, pick up a lot of stuff from a wealthy man like Solomon because he was one of the wisest men. The Bible called him wisest man in the world. Amen. Amazing. His mother's name was Bathsheba, and daddy was David. So you know the whole story already. But he begins to share these truths. Now, I want to give you one more thing. Better turn around. Everybody say better. Better turn around. You better turn around. Better, better turn around. At this time right now, I want you to hear this. Luke 17, 12. And he entered into a certain village, and there met him ten men that were lepers. That means their skin was falling off. They, their appendages were leaving them. They, they had to stand outside. The Bible says they stood afar off because they weren't allowed to mingle with anybody for fear the leprosy would get on somebody else. And there they were, ten men. And they lifted up their voices, and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go and show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass, as they went, they were cleansed. It's a powerful statement. In other words, as they, as they turned and walked away, Jesus didn't touch them. He, other places he touched lepers. But here, he just said, Go. go show, in other words, go to church. That's what he's saying here. Go to the priest. Go to the church. Go to the sanctuary. Go to the synagogue. Go. And as they went, their fingers came back, their toes came back, their ears came back, their nose, their skin began to clear up. The, the, the white marks in their flesh began to disappear, and the, the flesh became like baby skin again as they went. Ten of them went. And you can see them looking at each other. And Fred looked over at Jose and said, Man, dude, you have a nose again. And Jose looked back at Freddie and said, Freddie, you got ears. And they began to talk to each other as they walked. I'm, I don't know if they were Spanish or not, but I'm just saying. Uh, but as they walked, they began to, to gain strength again. And one of them, he wasn't Spanish, he wasn't English. He wasn't Jewish. He was Samaritan. He was a uh, kicked out. He was only joined because of the fellowship of pain. See, we all got the same pain, so we hang out together. It doesn't matter our culture, our nationality. We got the same pain. But as he walked, he realized, you know what? I really don't want to be with these guys. Because these guys here, they're all going to go back to their homes, and they're going to do their thing. They got their lives back. But that Samaritan began to walk away, and something began to happen to him. And Sammy the Samaritan turned around. And he went back toward Jesus. It's an amazing story. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. I'll say it again. You better turn around. It's a reflective action. It's when you reflect on what God has done in your life, and, and it affects you with action. And with a loud voice, he glorified God. Jesus! gratefulness began to pour out of him. And he kept giving thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus said, I'm pretty good with math. I believe there were 10 of you. I'm pretty sure there were 10 of you. There were, there were some English, some Spanish, some Jewish, amen, some Africans. Amen. There's, there's ten of you. I gotta be ten of you here. I, I, I saw you. You're a Samaritan. Well, you don't understand. I've been had racism against me. I've, had, I've been put down as a man. Then I got leprosy. 
but I realize you care for me. Amen. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten of you cleansed? Where are the other nine? They're not found that return to give glory to God except you. And he said to him, Rise, go your way. Your faith made you whole. When I read that word, W-H-O-L-E, whole, whole, wholeness is understanding your identity as a child of God, that you're, going, that you're saved, that you're going to heaven, the worry's gone, the fear's gone. But wholeness says I have purpose in my life. I understand I was born with a purpose. God, you gave me purpose. Wholeness, wholeness says so much about our lives. Amen. So not just healed. Some people get healed. Some people get whole. I want to be whole. Amen. To have a reason for living. And at that moment, he said, where, where did the other nine go? You know, I, I don't know what happened to them, but I know Thessalonians says, give thanks in all circumstances. It's the will of God. Ephesians says, giving thanks always for all things. All things. He said, your faith made you whole. What were the other, un, other nine thinking? What were they thinking? Do you know? Well, let me do it this way. Do you know how many people I know that have been healed, miraculously healed of God, that said, I'm going to serve God the rest of my life, that have walked away from church, walked away from Jesus, went back to their old ways, and the one thing that haunts them is they know that God touched them. They know they've been healed. They know they were delivered. They know that everything was right, and they stayed with God. And here's the thing. I had a young man sitting on my porch this week. had gone through some terrible things. It was his own fault. He said, Pastor, what, I, what am I going to do? I said, it's, next, it's tomorrow. And when you get to tomorrow, are you going to do the same thing you're thankful for today? And if the next day after tomorrow, will you be thankful for the things you were two days ago? And can you continue? Because if you can do this, you can do it for a year and 10 years and 20 years. and 30. You can stay with God. But if you ever forget that it was God that pulled you out, if you ever forget that it was God that healed you, it was God that hurt you, it was God that took away the fear in your life, it was God that healed your body, it was God that touched your children. If you ever forget, you're in trouble. And I want to tell you that God will be reminded, where are the others? Where did you go? Heads bowed, eyes closed. It's only God that can bring comfort, gives compassion. When we give thanks, we return. The return of joy and gladness causes us to live in thanksgiving. It's where you've been that will make you thankful for where you're going. God, I pray you give us eyes to see your blessings. Open our eyes. Give us hands ready to reach out to help people in need. and Give us hearts to rejoice in you. Let our lips learn to sing praise in this house and throughout the week. Help us understand that whether we see it or not, whether we know it or not, whether we feel it or not, God, you're good all the time. You're good all the time. Now I want to ask you to be with me on this thought the gift of repentance. I want to repent for not being thankful enough this year. I just want to tell you, God, I should be more thankful for the blessings I've had, for the life I've lived, for the good things you've done in my life. I lift my hand before you right now, God, and ask you to forgive me. In fact, you'd go ahead and join me with your hand in the air. In the name of Jesus, everyone pray. Lord Jesus, let the next 12 months bring thanksgiving into my home, business, and life. I thank you. And I'll do this again next year. And I'll remind myself to stay thankful. You're a good father in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here. Oh, yes, I thank you, God. Oh, I think thanks matters. I was 16 years old, first time I asked God to do something for me. I didn't know God, didn't know how to serve God, didn't know anybody else who didn't know God. I knew folk went to church, but didn't know people knew God, Kenny. I was laying in the hospital, my eardrum had ruptured in my right ear. Doc said I was going to lose the hearing in my right ear. I had pneumonia. 
in the hospital. Put me in the hospital. You need to understand something. We couldn't afford as a family to put any of our family in the hospital. We didn't have the monies to put people, but my parents were so afraid that this sickness in my life was going to take me out. So they put me in the hospital. I laid there on that bed, my left ear, I laid down on my left ear, it was on the pillow, and I asked God to heal me. I mean, I was in pain. See, you change when you hurt enough or learn enough. I said, God needs you to heal me. At that moment, the doctor came in said my name. When he said my name, I heard him in this ear. And I knew immediately the pain was gone. And when I knew the pain was gone and I could hear in this ear, he examined my ear and he said, your eardrums come back together. I mean, it's, it's overnight. It's, it's already healed up. He said, I can't believe it. I remember the stupidness I said, ain't that penicillin something? I was afraid. I was scared. I was scared because I knew God heard me. And when I knew God heard me, it affected me. I was like, at that moment, I learned about what is I call the Holy Ghost hook. <laughs> and for the next three years, I fought that hook. I ran from that hook. That hook yanked me. But November the 10th, 1979, God reeled me on in. When you ask God to do something in your life and he does it, you better prepare yourself. Amen. You're looking for a turnaround. You better turn around. Come back and give him thanks. Amen. Amen. If you need to tie the offer an envelope that they're right there in front of you and you give God thanks today. You know, when I give my finances, I'm telling God thanks for this week of finances and the blessings in my life. When God gives me over and above, I'll make sure that I return back that which should be given to him. I'm very thankful about the faithfulness and the giving in this house. Amen. So if you, if you give it on your phone as our servant leaders, come up. I need your help, guys. Amen. As you go through, if you give it on your phone, do this, please. Show them your phone. Show them your phone. Say, no, I, I'm giving on my phone. You know, I'm not trying to get away. I'm giving on my phone because I believe in giving. I believe in this house. I believe in taking care of the ministry of this house. I appreciate this man on this piano over here. He's doing a great job with our teenagers here. Amen. <laughs> appreciate Pastor Joseph. A lot of stuff going on. Tonight at 6 o'clock here at Crosby at the high school auditorium is a community Thanksgiving service. Now, Again, we're only so many here, but if we could show up at 6 o'clock tonight, with the, there are other pastors going to be there, there are churches, and, and uh, so I'm, I'm not doing anything there other than showing up and being, uh, being in the presence of the Lord with them, but it's going to be at the high school, uh, so I guess that's the building right over yonder, amen, for you to go to. Just look for where the cars are parked in the back, 6 o'clock tonight, amen, if you'd like to come and be a part of that. Other than that, I pray you have a great Thanksgiving, that the Lord bless you. And as we give today, amen, we believe in God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Amen. So don't forget tonight at 6 o'clock, it'll slip by you if you're not.